Dr. R.C. Sproul claims there's a myth floating around the church today that tithing was strictly an Old Testament practice. Now, it's true that there is no explicit commandment in the New Testament that requires the tithe. On the other hand, there is nothing in the New Testament that remotely suggests that that principle of the tithe was ever abrogated. We're talking about money today on Renewing Your Mind. Welcome to the Sunday edition of our program. I'm Lee Webb, and I'm sure if you polled most pastors, they would tell you the sermon topic they dread the most is tithing. But when the Bible addresses it, we should as well. We continue Dr. R.C. Sproul's verse-by-verse study through the book of Acts. And today we'll be in chapter 4, looking at the story of Ananias and Sapphira. It's a lesson Dr. Sproul has called Lying Donors. You can follow along by turning to Acts chapter 4, starting with verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. And neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own. But they had all things in common. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and they brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the feet of the apostles. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. While it remained, was it not your own? After it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. And Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, The feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. And then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. And so great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. He who has ears to hear the word of God, let them hear it. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, as we contemplate these tragic events that marred the beginning of the New Testament church, we pray that as they have been written for our instruction, we may give great heed to them. For we ask it in the name of Christ. Amen. If you've ever spent any time in church, whether this church or any other church, certainly at one time or another, you've heard the preacher say that the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And we've heard that so often that it becomes one of those phrases that we just let slip across our lips without giving much thought to it. But let's take a moment and consider it, what the Scriptures tell us about the disposition of God 
towards those people whom he has redeemed when they bring their tithes and their offerings to him, not grudgingly, not dragging their feet, not murmuring and groaning and complaining about the burden of God's taxation upon them, but they come with a sense of joy. They bring their gift to the altar with pleasure. It's their delight to give that gift to God. And what the Scripture says is that when God looks down at one of the people whom He has redeemed and sees that attitude, that spirit of giving, that He's delighted. But there's obviously the antithesis of that. What does that teach us about God's disposition to the reluctant giver or the one who doesn't give at all or the one who lies as he brings his gift to the altar? We've read this text this morning. It tells us about situation in the first century church when, as we saw in chapter 2 of Acts, that the early Christians held things in common, but not by requirement. That their hearts were knit together of one accord, and the gifts that they brought for the common use of the people were all done in a spirit that was voluntary. They didn't have to do it. And we see this amazing contrast here between Barnabas who goes out and sells his property, and he takes every last penny of the proceeds from that property, far more than God requires. And out of a spirit of generosity and encouragement comes and lays that gift at the feet of the apostles. And he's named the son of encouragement. And in contrast to Barnabas is this couple, Ananias and Sapphira, who come together in a conspiracy And they decide to sell a piece of their property, but they act as if all of the proceeds from this sale are going to be given to the Christian church and for the work of Christ. But this is all a pretense. They give a portion of the gift, acting as if they're giving it all, and they keep the rest for themselves. And they have the audacity to lie not only to the apostles and to the church, but as Peter points out their transgression, you're lying to the Holy Ghost. And with their transgression, God takes their lives instantly. Now, what would happen if God instantly took the life of every professing Christian who didn't tithe. The last poll I saw said that those who claim to be born again of that number, only 4% tithe of their income to God. And as we saw when we looked at the text in Malachi a year or so ago, that God says when people withhold from Him the full tithe, that they are robbing Him, that they're stealing from Him. And if the polls are accurate, that means that 96% of us systematically, regularly, with hardness of heart, steal from God. Now, can you imagine any regenerate person willfully, with malice of forethought, setting out to rob from God? I can't. I really can't. And so the other thing I can figure is either people who profess to be Christians aren't Christians at all, they're just playing at church, or more commonly, people don't really realize what their duty is as Christians to help finance the kingdom of God. The greatest barrier we have in spreading the gospel across the world and through missionary activities is the lack of finances. It's that simple. And it's because there are so few Christians who are cheerful in bringing their tithes into the storehouse. Now, 
this whole business of stewardship and tithing and giving and so on is fraught with a host of misunderstandings, confusion, questions, myths that I don't have time to treat in detail here, and I can't wait. I'm more eager for this sermon to be over than you are. <laughs> this is where you like to have a bring in a guest speaker and have him speak on it. And then you just, but again, I would be ducking my responsibility if I did that. But I want to just briefly address three common myths about tithing. The first myth is that tithing was strictly an Old Testament practice that is abandoned in the New Testament and is no longer binding on the believing Christian of the New Covenant. Now, it's true that there is no explicit commandment in the New Testament that requires the tithe, as was set down by the law of God to the people of Israel in the Old Testament. On the other hand, there is nothing in the New Testament that remotely suggests that that principle of the tithe that God gave to Israel was ever abrogated. And Jesus frequently talked about those who remained faithful to that principle, even down to the woman who brought her might. She was impoverished. She was seriously impoverished. But nevertheless, that was the greatness of the tithe principle, that not everybody was required to give the same amount of money. But everybody was required to give the same percentage. And if you were more prosperous than your brother or sister... You were giving more money, of course, to the work of the kingdom, but not a greater percentage. If there ever was a flat tax that was perfectly just, it was that one imposed upon God that was the same for everybody. And here's where we get that distorted. I've read in the paper of people who were billionaires, who were worth $10 billion. And I'm thinking, I wonder how much $10 billion invested yields in a year. If it's a 10% return, it's a billion dollars. And that would the tithe be in a billion dollars. Figure it out. A hundred million, that's right, very good. So the guy who has $10 billion who increases his income by a billion... His tithe would be a hundred million. But then you read in the paper about this man who donates a million dollars to a college or a million dollars to his church. And we name the college after him, even though he's a one percent tither, even though he has systematically robbed God of what? How much? Ninety nine million, right? It's a good thing that that person wasn't around in the first century or God would zap him for his gift. (laughs) But we exalt people like that because we don't know what percentage anybody's giving to anybody at any one time. We don't know that. But God does. And God knows how much he's prospered me. He knows how much he's prospered you. He knows the widow with her might. And the same requirement is given to all of us, and that requirement has never, ever been removed. And if anything, the New Testament labors the point that the benefits that we receive from the hand of God in the New Covenant are far greater, far richer than anything the people of Israel ever dreamed of. And so what about the obligations? He gives us more, so now we give him less. I worked in a church several years ago where the denomination came with this program to tell the congregation the theme for the year was take a step toward tithing. And I said, thank you very much. I'm not going to preach that. Because that assumes that it's okay to be less than at the level of being the tither. That's why my program was take a step from tithing. Let's assume that you're already tithing, 10%. And we're supposed to be giving tithes and offerings. And that's something that should be automatic for every Christian. It's no big deal. Even Jesus said to the Pharisees, they tithe their mint, their cumin. They were scrupulous about their tithe. He says, that's the lesser things. And you omit the weightier matters of the law of justice and mercy. But that doesn't mean that, that Jesus said this is a lesser matter that therefore we can ignore it. No. It's a little thing that every one of us 
should be happy to do. Let's go to the second myth. I hear this all the time from ministers, that all of your tithe has to go to your local church and can't be supporting seminaries and Christian colleges or evangelistic programs or particular missions and so on. It all has to go to the local church because the local church is the storehouse. Have you heard that? In the Old Testament, all the gifts were brought into the storehouse, a central receiving position, because Israel was a theocracy. It had a divided priesthood, the Levites, who were in charge of both the education of the people and the worship of the people. And all of the produce and livestock was brought to one central place because there was only one central church, one central sanctuary, the temple. And so then the idea is, well, okay, come into the New Testament. Now all of our tithes are supposed to come into one central place, and we're told that that central place is the local church. Now, again, I don't know whoever invented that theory, but my guess is it was a pastor of a local church <laughs> because he didn't want the money that his people were giving going outside the walls of that local church. And I said, but think about that for just a minute. If we're going to have the principle of one single sanctuary where everybody sends their money, in the Lutheran church, that would mean that all of Lutherans would give all of their gifts and tithes to a central agency of the Lutheran church nationally, and then that central board would distribute the funds to the local congregations, or the Presbyterians, or the Baptists, or what. But even more so, if you're really going to be strict on this application, we should ask the federal government to start a new bureau the Bureau of Tithing and the Distribution of Tithes and Offerings, so that every Christian who's a tither sends his tithe now to Washington and then asks the government to distribute it to all the local churches. Now, I don't think there are too many pastors would want that to happen. Now, the, the fact is, ladies and gentlemen, there's not a single bit of evidence biblically that the local church is to receive all of your tithe or that it is the storehouse. That identification is never made in the scriptures. So don't think that you have to give all your tithe to St. Andrews if you're a member of St. Andrews. You're still free to to give it wherever else the work of Christ is going on. I do personally think that the lion's share of a person's tithe should come to their local church. But people say, well, give all our gifts to the local church, and the local church will support our missionaries, our educators, our seminaries, and our colleges. Please, I've been on the boards of these institutions, colleges and seminaries, and I know there's not a seminary in America, not a Christian college in America that could stay open another month if they depended 100% on the gifts from churches. Because it just doesn't happen. They rely on people like you and me, who in addition to the giving they have to the churches, they also give to support these other missions. The third myth, and I'll try to get over this quickly, is the one I hear more often than any of the others, and it's the one that's the saddest to hear. I hear it from people. People look me in the eye, it's a straight face, and they say, I can't afford to tithe. Can you imagine that? I can't afford to tithe. And I want to say to that person, please don't stand before Almighty God who has given you from His bounty so much and tell your Lord who has spared nothing, withheld nothing from you that you can't afford to tithe. Particularly, if we would look in this congregation today and find the poorest person in this congregation, I don't know who that person is, but let's find him. That person, whoever you are, who's the poorest person in this congregation, is living and enjoying a higher standard of living than 99% of the people who have ever walked the face of this earth. But we say we can't afford to tithe. Let me tell you what that really means. It means I cannot afford to do all the things that I'm doing now, to spend all the money I'm spending now, and give 10% of my income to the Lord. Well, let's be honest with you. If you're saying, I don't want to give 10% to the Lord because I want to keep it, then let your patron saint be Ananias or Achan in the Old Testament who held back the silver and gold from the defeat of the city of Jericho, for which he was stoned and then burned. Beloved, there's nobody in this room who honestly can say they cannot afford to give 10% of their earnings to the work of Jesus Christ. But again, I don't like to talk about this because the last thing I want anybody to do is give a penny to the work of God and to the work of Christ grudgingly. Because what God loves 
is the cheerful giver. What God loves is the person who says, whoa, I didn't really realize that this weight of responsibility was on me. I haven't really put this in my budget. I never really thought about it. I've never been convicted of it by God the Holy Spirit. But now that I stop and think about it, it's so clear that if I'm going to honor God with my life and with my possessions, then I should be glad to do whatever it takes to change my lifestyle, to bring my giving up to where it ought to be. Because remember, the tithe is the low point. It's not the high hurdle. It's not the ideal. It's the starting point of Christian charity and of giving. Now, let me just say one last thing. And remember, I have the right to say in conclusion more than once. I don't know if I told you the story a couple years ago about the two pieces of currency that met on the street. The $100 bill met the dollar bill. The $100 bill said to the dollar bill, yo, you can't believe where I've been. I've been all over the world. I've been flying first class. I've taken luxury cruises. I've eaten at five-star restaurants. I've stayed in five-star hotels. I've met with kings and queens and princesses and all over the place with the jet set. And all these stories that are regaling this poor little $1 bill who's never been outside the country, never stayed in a five-star hotel. He says, I've never been in any of those places. I've never met a king or a queen. Never ate in a five-star restaurant. Never flown first class in a plane. But I'll tell you this, I go to church every Sunday. (laughs) Tell you something else about inflation. 50 years ago, I remember it was the custom. If you went to a church that was not where you were a member, and you just dropped in for a visit, and they passed the plate, what was the customary donation? A dollar. But we've had 50 years of inflation since then. But that's one place that hasn't impacted <laughs> our, our customs in this country. Finally, and this is for finally, I've never met a tither in my life who said to me, R.C., the worst mistake I ever made was the day I decided to be a tither. When I sit back and think of all the money I've given to the church, building programs, mission projects, all the money I've given to evangelistic services and all of that stuff, the other day I sat down and I added it up and over the last 30 years I gave enough money away to the church and to the work of Christ that had I kept it I could have a winter home in Paris. I've never heard anybody say that. I've never met a tither who's missed a penny that he or she has given with a grateful heart to the work of Christ. And I have to say to you, since the day I was a Christian, I've been a tither. And every year I look at the gross, what it is that God gusses me with, and before income taxes, before anything else, the first thing, the first person that gets paid is the Lord. So I practice what I'm preaching here this morning. And I'm not asking you to do anything that I haven't been doing myself from the day I became a Christian. The hard part is being a Christian, not doing it, and then starting to do it, because now you're going to make adjustments. But if you have to make adjustments, do it. And do it cheerfully. And you watch the heavens open. You watch God's response. Because guess what? He really does love a cheerful giver. You just cannot outgive him. Because the more you give him, the more he bestows upon you. Amen. That's the good news of God's economy. We cannot outgive him. Dr. Sproul delivered this sermon from the pulpit of St. Andrew's Chapel, where he serves as co-pastor. He's been going through the entire book of Acts, and we'll continue uh, this series on the Sunday edition of our program. We've looked at a very practical, very common issue today through the story of Ananias and Sapphira. These early chapters of Acts deal with many practical issues of the Christian life, including evangelism. Those early weeks after the day of Pentecost provide us with many examples of people proclaiming the gospel boldly. The final directive that Jesus gave the apostles was to go and make disciples. Dr. Sproul has written a very helpful booklet to help us understand evangelism in the 21st century. It's called, What is the Great Commission? 
For your gift of any amount today, we'd like to send you two copies. Our number is 800-435-4343. You can also go to renewingyourmind.org to make your request and give your gift. This booklet is part of the Crucial Question series, more than two dozen titles by Dr. Sproul that help answer many common questions, including, can I know God's will? Can I trust the Bible? And does prayer change things? You can explore all of the Crucial Question booklets at Ligonier's website. And again, for your gift of any amount, we'd like to send you two copies of What is the Great Commission? Our phone number is 800-435-4343. And our web address again is renewingyourmind.org. Well, next Sunday, Dr. Sproul returns for his exposition through the book of Acts with a message about a prison break and civil disobedience. You won't want to miss the message titled, If It Is of God. That's next Sunday here on Renewing Your Mind. Sing of the beauty of the heavenly city and 